All right, so let's do it. Alex, how are you doing on this beautiful, lovely evening of ours? I'm doing swimmingly. Swimmingly, good. Um, That's fantastic. Just like Dory. Good. All right. You want to yeah. um, introduce yourself? <laughs> yes. Hello, everybody. I'm Graphically Alex. I do a lot of anti-FA YouTube. I talk a lot about weight loss, fatness. We talk about hormone health. We talk about the reasons why people are obese, why they choose to be. Or, you know, I do believe it's a choice, for example, which I know is so controversial. Um, but I've currently lost... 90 pounds of fat, gained 12 pounds of muscle since summer of 2022. Hallelujah. And yeah, thank you so much. And um, so my channel is really about, honestly, anti-FA activism. So I'm trying to literally destroy this movement, essentially. I know that that's kind of radical to say, but I want it to be done. It is horrible. The health implications are very bad. Um, I feel that they're trying to normalize this for a younger generation. And it, I think it's one of the most important issues of our time. So that's what I've chosen to dedicate myself to on that channel. And I'll have your um, channel linked do... in the um, description of this channel. Yes. So you can go, you guys can go ahead and check out Alex's channel down below in the description. And that'll be linked. Make sure to subscribe. He's a great person with amazing style and also the monolith of masculinity, obviously. <laughs> sure yes i'm sure i'd be totally red pill approved but uh <laughs> what i want to say too is um i do do some like anti-fa or like what is it fat acceptance tiktok videos you know i try to keep it more light it's not supposed to be like super dark and deep all the time but we do get a little bit more serious like i said because there is definitely an activistic approach to my channel like i do i want to empower people to fight this rhetoric um not just online but also in their personal lives and you know support people who are trying to lose weight especially and so. you you started at um you were you were obese and you, you had problems with your weight too right obviously at one point yes so i was um so i okay i'm trying to think about how to say it because of youtube you yeah, know they're, okay. they're, they're tos but basically, I I was super morbidly obese. Um, at my highest, I was around 383 at 6'1". 6'1 so, is pretty good, though. That's pretty good for you. 6'1? <laughs> you got to call up your parents and thank them for the genetics. Oh, my gosh. You know what's weird is both my parents are drastically shorter than me, so I don't know. Mm, it's weird. I might have to question the parents then. I look just like both of them, though. So it doesn't work, but <laughs> maybe they, I don't know. Maybe but they anyway. gave you something like they gave Homelander in the, uh, that home. What is that show called? The Homelander show with the, what is that show? Oh, called? I don't know. Okay. Well, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. But anyways, whatever. Maybe it's some weird thing about being gay. I don't know. Sometimes gay people are taller. I don't know. It's, it's confusing. I don't understand it. Anyways, it happened. And um, basically, I was 383 due to a complicated interaction between having severe BED in my teenage years and early 20s. And then in my later 20s, because of that ED, I had developed hypothyroidism very, very severely. So to, like, I talk a lot about on my channel to the point of dying of the disease around 2020. And since then, I changed my diet and did a lot of different things. Um, and I've started getting it under control. And based on certain things that I learned, I try to talk about it on my channel, essentially. So I've lost, like I said, 90 pounds since August of 2022 because I I had to take that long to recover my thyroid. Now tell tell me, like, what... When you lose weight, right? Like, so tell me about the techniques that you use. Like, what kind of like Taekwondo or like Kaioken methods are you using to like try to lose that weight? Like, you've lost, you said 90 pounds. So, like, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of like diets did you use or like walk me through that a little bit? Okay. So, essentially, I do a pro thyroid protocol, which essentially is a diet that focuses on avoiding 
pretty much all seed oil consumption. So seed oils are very harsh on thyroid health. Um, and as you know, people who are very, very obese, they've eaten plenty of them. So if you think of like your fried foods, your restaurants, your takeout, especially things like chips, things like processed foods that are put in the microwave, they all have copious amounts of these oils in them. And when you overeat it to excess, it goes into your fat cells. So then you still have it, even if you're not eating it, basically. And so it, it really affects the way your thyroid functions on a physical level, and it can cause hypothyroidism. So basically, I avoid it entirely. And then other than that, I just make sure that I get animal protein, so like a meat, a, a nice serving of meat each day, yeah. dairy. I get carbs, so I make sure I have carbs, whether it's simple sugars or starches, whatever, just something carb-related and salt and saturated fat. So I do make sure I get calories? those five ingredients. I do. Okay. So to also to lose weight, I count calories and I'm very active. Oh, that's so good. So I, yeah. So a lot of time in 2021, I focus more so on the diet to get the hormone back in check or try to like come back from the dead basically. And then over 2022, I took on an active job. So I started really hitting activity where I was walking a lot like and i mean like five hours a day type of walking were you canvassing and no i don't want to stay on my job <laughs> oh, okay because i remember i did canvassing job uh i don't know when it was maybe like 2018 and it was uh terrible because i remember i was doing it in vans so i oh know about gosh. like walking a lot i, I walk a lot yeah. organically already but yeah go ahead yeah so it's just it's a physical job that's all i'll say mm -hmm. it's a physical job it's a job where you have to walk basically and so I did that in 2022, and then I started counting calories. I got, I had recovered to the point where I could do just your basic calories in, calories out to start losing the weight. But I, it was a lot of like body recomp at a bigger size yeah. and getting those that fat profile down. So having much more saturated, much less seed oil fat and trying to balance it. And so through that, I had enough energy to live, you know, because you have to have the energy to walk, to walk, right. basically. So, and then as soon as I got the energy, I did it. And I also do weightlifting at the gym. Oh, so that's beautiful. I, yeah. I don't do it year round because hypothyroidism gets worse in the winter. So a lot of oh, times that's interesting. in the winter, I, I can't, yeah. I it's didn't know that seasonal. gets worse in the winter. Mm -hmm. It's like a holiday for you then. No, because I was suffering every winter. <laughs> but, but I am getting better now, which is crazy. So I don't know if I'll have to stop this year. What is, is um, crazy. What is your goal weight? My goal weight, I don't have a weight. I go by body fat percentage. So mm -hmm. it's to be 17%. 17%? That's my percent? At six goal. foot, six foot mm -hmm. one? Mm -hmm. You got a lot of wiggle room. Yeah, for it's, sure. It's good and, that you're six um, foot one then. That's great. I mean, that's fantastic to be six foot one. I wish I could say the same. How tall are you? I'm I'm 5'10 currently. But if I wear boots, I'm closer to six feet. But it doesn't give me like two inches. But I like to tell people it gives me two inches. I feel like I don't know what two inches actually that's is. That's not a bad height, though. I mean, I don't want to get all into like a heightist conversation. But I don't think that's bad. No, it's not too bad. I don't think it's like actually infer. I don't think it's inferred any damage upon my life. So, I mean, yeah. it's, it's but still, I'd much rather be more close to six foot. As anybody would. You want the six foot status? If you, yeah, of course. Um, but luckily, I got height in other places. Oh my gosh. I mean, I don't know. I guess it's good. I don't know. It's just a different. I think the gay world is just different. It's totally different. I think it's but, also good um, that you found a, like an active job because I see so many times like these fat mm -hmm. acceptance people like they're locking themselves in very sedentary jobs. You know? Yes. Yes, and, and I understand that's, why. that's one of the beauties of being a part of like Western culture is that we like seed a lot of our physical jobs over to like other countries. And then as a byproduct of that, a lot of us here are not, you know, like physically demanding job positions. That's true. That's very, very true. Um, and I think it is. It's honestly been one of the life saving things of of the past couple years.
is having that job because it forces you to be active. So I would almost even suggest it, honestly. It's been that helpful to me. Yeah, because it's probably taking your mind off of like food and then you also have so much time you're working and things such and so forth, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then just the activity of it all, you know, it does burn calories at the end of the day, especially if you're, if you're walking that much and you weigh like as much as I did, I was almost 400 pounds. You can burn a hell of a lot of calories walking for multiple hours. You know, you're totally right. People sleep on, I feel like that's the number one cardio because it's like the most natural one that you can actually do. Like when I go to the gym, I don't, I don't do cardio at the gym. I just walk to the gym, which is like, I don't know, like a mile and a half to two miles. Okay. So that's what yeah, I'm for sure. When I think too, a lot of times I try really hard on my channel to focus from like a super morbidly obese perspective, because there's certain dynamics where like walking for somebody who's maybe just obese, maybe it isn't that big of an exercise or that big of a workout. But when you're like super morbidly obese, walking can be a very strenuous task. Yeah, you know, definitely. It can be like you're out of breath you're sweating heavily right so i think it's important to like and and then the dangers of being outside in general like homeless guys there could be like a robber or something like that you know crazy people depending on where you live for sure so (laughs) you got that stuff too you know so that's already that's going to encourage you to move faster oh my gosh you can get you to run into a sprint um anna o'brien style that's really good though focusing i feel feel like the physicality of being fat like it gets slept on because i see a lot of these fat activists and i think like one of their big issues is like they're going to be blown out knees by the time they're 30 you know yeah so i think a lot of times fat activists they're comforted by youth they have this idea in their mind that the fatness itself doesn't present issues but I talk a lot on my channel how the fatness itself does cause hormonal imbalance and it causes hormone problems that cause other issues. So even something like your knees, if you're really, really super morbidly obese, it's not just the weight. It's also the fact that being super morbidly obese, you're likely to have very high estrogen. If you have very high estrogen, then you're going to have high cortisol. If you have high cortisol then it will break down muscle tissues and connective tissues in the body including the knees so it is like an indirect thing but the obesity itself is causing breakdown of the knees yeah and also so the I weight right the weight understand. of having yes, like gravity itself is like pushing you down upon yeah. the earth and so that's obviously yes. like it's like impeding it's like doubling up right on the yes. joint so it's really attacking your knees from two different thoughts from the structural integrity of it and the actual mechanical stress on it at the same time so it's yeah definitely i agree i mean would 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 you ever how much weight would you ever be interested in like talking to any like fat activists uh i would but i they'd be terrified of me why why do you think they'd be terrified of you oh because i don't you have like a gun lie to me oh no yeah i'm gonna have a weapon that could be used through the power of the internet you can you could do it you know how many times i've been threatened over the internet oh my god how about how often have you been threatened so sometimes i like to go on like an app where you just kind of like talk to people you know like omegle except without dicks and i don't know like some, it's like the number one thing that people do is like i'll beat i'll beat you up dude you don't even know like i'm super strong and it's it always happens and i always think like it's got to be the cringiest thing to to threaten to beat somebody up over, over the internet Cause like, what are you gonna do? Yeah, it's pretty cheese. Pretty it's cheese. The worst though. thing you can do is just whip it out, like right there. That that would really get me going, you know. That would that would definitely hurt me more than just threatening me <laughs> over the internet. But I would love I I I don't know about you, but I've hit up so many fat activists on all over like all multiple social medias, and I've only gotten replies from like maybe wow. out of like twenty of them, I've only gotten replies from like maybe five at most, and they all think I'm terrible. Why do you think they think you're so terrible? I think that most of them are really, really secure in the bubble that they've, like, built for themselves. So, like, outside people are just, like, always going to be harmful. Kind of like the Native Americans when Columbus came over. You know what I'm talking about? Like, they have this, like, really, really safe spot where they don't really have anybody push, with the exception of the comments. Which, I mean, most of the time they delete from. And they don't want to be challenged. I mean, they have no reason to be challenged. Like, they, they see no benefit. 
Yeah, I could see that. Because I think, I mean, I wouldn't be scared to talk to anybody. I mean, I think I could, I'd probably be able to absolutely eviscerate somebody, like one of them, with a within a verbal confrontation or debate, I could probably make them want to cry after. Oh, you think so? Because it's like, I'm, yeah, I think... The thing about a lot of FAs in my mind is that they play this, like, they act like they're so innocent, you know? And I know that they're vicious. They are very, very vicious people. So for me, I can be vicious too. Oh, yeah? And so they fight never... fire with fire? Mm -hmm. I'm very fight fire with fire when it comes to FA because it's a very emotional movement. And I feel like to ultimately destroy it, it has to be fought emotionally. And I'm good at that. I feel like I've met, I've seen a few people in the fat acceptance community that try to quote like studies or things like that. You know, like I've seen it a few times on TikTok, but they try. yeah, I've seen it. So I've seen it a few times. And whenever I see them try, quad, try, try to like quote statistics or like facts, it's always something that's not even relevant to whatever they're talking about. And yes. I think they see like, oh, the number here is kind of correlating. Therefore, it should relate. And it's always like never it's never related it's always completely different and yeah. like i remember one time they brought up some like the ugly tax do you know what that is i haven't heard of that so i'm my bad the ugly law know. so like here in the united states there was a law where like people that were really really disabled or like short people or things like that were maybe not like seen favorably out in public and then i remember i watched this whole video of this woman going through this and then at the end of the video there was like not like not even a lick of somebody being fat. And I even looked up the law. It has nothing to do with fat people. But when you can like draw correlations, like sometimes people are not gonna look into those things, you know? And then you just hear a, you just right. hear this person say this and you're like, oh my God, there is systemic problems. Mm -hmm. When in reality it's not. Yeah. Yeah. Because in my mind, I think that there's there's really I'd say there's maybe two or three major motivations for an FA to do what they do. The first one is the most obvious. I think it makes them money. So I think a lot of them actually do make money doing it or they're able to, you know, branch off or, or launch a career. It's like career reasons. Does that make sense? So it's to get attention, to say something, to launch themselves in some way. I think that's probably one of the more common reasons. The other two reasons would be, um, because they have an ed and they're trying to justify their ed or hide their ed and so they use tiktok as a way to do that where i've started talking more about bed on my channel where i talk about one of the major things is secrecy so when an fa says i cannot like i eat just as much as my thin friends a lot of times it's a blatant lie and it's a form of secrecy. So it's a way to try to justify what it is that they're doing in the privacy, you know, in those quiet nights where they're running to the fridge and doing that type of stuff. So that's another reason why I think, I think running might be a like strong a... word there. I think, uh, you know, maybe, maybe like waddling or walking very slowly with agonizing pain, but yeah, go ahead. Oh my gosh. I... <laughs> Um, but I'm talking those types of people. So there's that group as well. And then I think there are people who are just honestly abjectly evil. So people who are actively promoting it to either push some other agenda that I think is probably nefarious or because they're like a woman that wants to lower the competition in the field dating wise, which to me, that's just evil. What do you mean? Because what do you mean like a woman lowering the dating competition? So think about like if you're a fat woman and you're upset that you can't get an athletic guy, what you would do is try to encourage all other fat women to be fat so that oh, to like competition... to like debuff everyone else to like lift you up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I see what you're saying. So that's a, that would be more of an evil type of person or somebody who tried to lose weight themselves. But what if they're doing it inadvertently? Failed. Like what if they're doing it without the actual intent? Like what if they're just doing it passively? Um, I don't know if those types of people would get that popular. You don't think so? You know what I'm saying? No, because they'd be like very low scale. 
fa but do you like, do you know what i mean by like that you would say when i say passively i think like they're not doing it with the back of their mind thinking like oh yeah i'm gonna make everybody else intentionally fatter whilst making that's gonna like push me up like the with the rising tide right but i'm more so thinking mm -hmm. like what if they just think like that naturally without any like malicious intent involved like they're just you know what i'm saying like they think that it'd be just better if they if these women were fatter like fat women should just be more there should be more of them would they still be evil to you do you think um i think that there are definitely like people who i think especially very very young people right so super young people or maybe they've been taught fat acceptance rhetoric and they might passively accept it yeah. and think that it's true. That kind of person, sure. But they're usually not a fat activist. They're just somebody who will say a fat acceptance talking point on like a video. It's like a comment you would get. It'd be like, well, I tried this diet and it didn't work for me. So blah, blah, blah. Like just leave people alone kind of thing. Do you that think type that, of person. Do you think that like I most like fat acceptance people are doing what you think that they're do you think they're saying it like intentionally like you think they're they know what they're doing and that mm -hmm. they they're encouraging this type of behavior intentionally i honestly do yeah because when you're an activist you are working towards something you have an agenda like you are doing something so it's and i think with them it is like the air they breathe the water they drink especially someone like aubrey gordon like she is a very good example She's of, beautiful. She is a fat activist. Activist. Like, yeah. she absolutely has an agenda. Everything she does, it's intentional. Somebody like, I think, Samira. Everything she's doing, there is some motive. Did you hear her song? It. Well, she. I think she's doing it more for a career thing, to yeah. be honest. Did you, do you like her new song, though? The one that she put out on TikTok? It's on, like, every one of her videos. I don't think I've heard it yet. You, you haven't heard it? It's like, if you go on her, her TikTok right now, it's like, because she's promoting it heavy, it's like her fat acceptance song. So it's like, if you <laughs> scroll through the, the TikTok, you're just going to hear it like a million times. I think she... Unrelated side note, she is talented. But I'm just saying, she's trying to push an agenda. You know what I'm she's saying? She's got amazing like, I do skin not too. I... Well, yeah. I mean, I don't... I think she's pretty and stuff, but... I think a lot of them are, you know, because a lot of times they they act as if they're so against beauty standards and all this stuff, but they go along with every other one. That is a, that is actually a really good point. I see them quite a, like all the time applying shades and shades and shades of makeup religiously in every single. And then they always focus on, oh, I can't buy clothes and this and that. And I always think, like, why does it matter? Like, if you guys are really out here trying to redefine the beauty standard, like, I don't know why you guys are so content following the certain ones that you guys really believe in. Mm hmm. You know? Yeah, because a lot of fat activist people, especially, they're very like, they're like ruthlessly ambitious. And I can see it. You know, I don't know if it's just because I, I am ambitious myself or, you know, like I've talked many times on my channel. I love Taylor Swift, for example. And she's a very ruthlessly ambitious woman, extremely ambitious. So I guess I can see it easier in women. I don't know. Because a lot of people assume women are not ambitious, which is just not true at all. And so when I see a fat activist, I see that they are ruthlessly pursuing a goal. Absolutely. The way when you know, I look it, at these like fat activists, most of the time, I kind of feel like most of it's ignorance to where uh, I think they might hear one or two things and maybe they research some stuff and then maybe they put themselves in like this boat of the fat acceptance movement. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think most of them are actively pursuing this i think that it's just passive for them i think most people probably pursue things passively like you hear something you think it's cool mm -hmm. like i have a friend and he wasn't into like building computers right and then my other friend was like hey you know i'm really into building this computer i'm gonna build this computer and he thought about it he's like wow that sounds really cool and then he got into it and then started building it off of a, like a one you know small little passing comment i think a lot of people mm -hmm. do that in their day-to-day -day life where they hear something or they do something but when they're questioned on why they do that particular thing they don't have a reason. You know what I'm saying? They don't have the background because they don't, they've never actually had to research it. And I'm not saying that those fat act, act, activists don't exist. I know they're like Samara is a good example. I mm -hmm. think in that, that particular example, and even like Jordan Underwood too, like these people mm -hmm. are most definitely uh, 
doing it on purpose, they have an you know? Like they have they yes. have the agenda. But I feel like the majority of them are just saying it because they think it's right mm -hmm. and they don't really understand why. I think it's true in some cases. It's hard to make any blanket statement. Like I said, I think um Oh, I'm I'm completely I'm lot. completely fine with like generalities. So if you want mm -hmm. to like use generals, I'm completely fine with that. Because I, I would say like certain people, like as an example, I think probably like fat girl flow, she might be more of a passive person. But they tend to not post as much. Mm -hmm. She did have that huge splash about not being able to wipe her butt earlier this year, which that was kind of crazy. But it, it's kind of like she only did that because she felt personally attacked. That's it was a like a personal girl thing flow. for her. You didn't know about Whitegate or whatever? <laughs> uh, I might have seen her face and then like... Uh... I think Fat Girl Flow is the one I'm talking about. If I got it wrong, I'm sorry. It's the one that had the the drama about the the not being able to wipe. Uh, there was a lot so of that's them. That's who I'm trying to talk to. There was a lot of them. There was another girl that also couldn't do that and she had cancer. What? Yeah, she, but she beat the cancer um, because she started losing weight. Um... Oh, nice. Yeah. And she All was right. saying that she couldn't wipe herself for like a good half the year because she was like close to 500 pounds or something like that. But yeah. she's she had cancer and she beat it. Sometimes these people really need like a really big wake up call. And it's yeah. really it really sucks to say that, that cancer has got to be that thing. But for some people, I guess that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think for me, I definitely had to have a huge wake up call. Um, For me, it's not as much about like... I have to clarify too. It's not about hating the person. I just, like I said, I think that there's those three categories, like career oriented, the, which I think that'd be like a more than Tracy T. I think she's career oriented. I don't think she's evil or anything. And then the person that has BED that's trying to justify, which I think would be like, this is just my assumption, speculation, et cetera. But I would say somebody like feminist land whale. I don't think Feminist Landwell is an evil person. It's a crazy I name. That... I think that there's somebody that struggles with this particular ED and they're maybe unintentionally normalizing it, right? Because they're ignorant, like you said. Yeah. I do think that that does work. But there is the evil person, which I would say is somebody like definitely Hannah Talks Bodies. I think she's vicious. I don't think um, I've heard much of her in a while, though. I think she stopped posting. She quit. I think yeah. she quit. Yeah, but she was. Yeah, I saw I don't her. Have a there's a feeling. podcast here on YouTube yeah. called um, Fat Something. There's a Fat Acceptance podcast here on YouTube, and she did, she was on a, a recent episode like two months ago. I didn't watch the whole thing because it was agonizing to listen to. But uh, yeah, she she's still she's still like she's not on TikTok, but she's still doing like Instagram stuff, and she's also still mm -hmm. doing like YouTube stuff. So she's around. Oh, she is. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think, so like I said, I just think it's those three categories, but either way, I'm against it. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't really matter. What matters to me is the rhetoric itself. I don't want people to hear these things and actually believe them. You know, the amount of people that I've heard that believe that weight is purely genetic. It has completely <laughs> That's my favorite one, though. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that excuse because it takes all accountability off of you. Mm -hmm. And it's so incredibly common for people to believe that. The amount of people that don't believe in caloric realism um, is insane. So people who do not believe that the amount of calories you're eating correlate to your size, it's wild. And then it's so common and it's because of fat acceptance rhetoric. So and the issue that I have too is like, I've deeply suffered with this issue. Like, this is not something that I have just like casually, you know, like I've never been fat or I maybe was fat for a couple of years or something like, no, like I've been deep in it, deep in BED, deep in hypothyroidism, you know, to near death levels, been super morbidly obese for over a decade, been fat my whole life. You know, I know what this is. I know about this issue. Right. You've seen and it before. You got the experience to back it as well. The last thing we need is for this to be normalized. I would, I am not one of those people where because I suffered, I want everyone else to suffer. I want this to be not an issue. I want this to be gone. But wouldn't it be, yes. but what about like people that want to, like for instance, smoking cigarettes is not good. 
but I would still mm -hmm. want people to smoke cigarettes if they wanted to smoke cigarettes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think when I define it, how I define it a lot on my channel is I want somebody who wants to lose weight to be able to through right. knowing how to do it, through being culturally supported to do it. And Maybe be more enlightened, through... like have more resources. Mm -hmm. And even society should be structured probably a little differently. Yeah, I've always thought that maybe easier. we should have, like, in public school, which is where most people go to school, there should be some type of, like, nutritional training or something like that where people can get the basic outline of what food is and how to use it. Because, like, you're going to be eating for the entire extent of your life. And for some reason, so many people don't even know what a calorie is. Or, like, when you mm -hmm. read the back of the label, they have no idea what that is. Right. I would definitely, personally, I would advocate more for, like, parents to teach their kids, you know, and parents to know themselves, like, I think it's a parent's job to do that but the parents themselves need to know too yeah. you know so no, it's, like this has to be it has to be it's a societal kind of awakening that needs to occur on this issue and that's what i want to accomplish essentially well, i know it's a very ambitious goal but like i said i'm very ambitious right so but you, you said earlier that you didn't you, you don't want people like saying these particular types of things like you, you do want to like have people to stop saying this stuff like what do you mean by that I want people to know that it's a myth and it be completely dispelled, basically, especially in common society. I would like there to be a situation where if somebody says my weight is genetic, yeah, then somebody in the room who doesn't agree can freely say that's wrong. You know that that's wrong. And we do have that to a certain extent, but fat acceptance wants that to stop entirely. So I think it's important to recognize like a fat acceptance activist goal is that nobody's allowed to ever talk about their weight or ever yeah, that talk is about true. Yeah, weight. that is true. So it's defending that and also making it more common. I don't like fat shaming. I don't think it works. Um, but I don't think blatantly lying to somebody or gaslighting and saying that you're healthy the way you are is helpful at all either. And it's not necessarily everybody's job to police other people, so to speak. But we're in a difficult situation where fat acceptance is policing other people. So there has to be an equal Like a pushback, you that. think, yeah. An yes. equal pushback. I mean, these people are, like, dying in their mid-30s. You know, yes. like, I mean, or if they're not dying, which I'm always, a, like, whenever I see people like Amberlynn Reed or these people that have been chronically obese for the majority of their life, I'm always so surprised that they have the durability to withstand the amount of trauma that they've been under for the extent of time that they've been under it. So it's like, it's just a testament to the amount of durability that the human being, like, mm -hmm. human body even has. Like, I always think, like, Amberlynn would have been, like, a superhero if she didn't have to deal with all the problems mm -hmm. of her body, you know? But, um, yeah. I'm, it's possible. Yeah. I mean... I think that it's so difficult. Um, and again, I think a lot of people, there's a lot of people who are very big who, you know, they have a kind of squashed ambition or. Yeah, no pun intended. Or they're not right? able to. Kind of big. No, huh? pun, no pun intended. Well, no, I'm saying very big, like in, ten, in terms of like their size. Like right, right. they do have an ambition and they do have a drive and they do have desires and they do have goals and they want to do things and they want to accomplish things in life and they're held back and so there's a bitterness in that too you know and i think some people unfortunately they feel that well if i can't have it then i don't want anyone to have it and that's a very common thing in fat acceptance rhetoric and within especially the leaders in the movement so it just has to be it has to be pushed back on. It has I feel to like I see more of like yeah. an equ equity based system where they see like thin people that have access to basic, basic stuff. When in reality, most of the stuff that they're talking about is just like normal human being things. And they advocate for things that should be, they, they want them to be equaled out, you know? So like more elevator access when they have to buy two plane tickets, they want that to be subsidized by somebody or maybe making like a, one of the crazier ones is uh, making buildings a little bit bigger or wider stairwells oh, yeah, or making wild. the hallways or the bathrooms or whatever it may be. They want it to be – or, you know, another one will be like towels, like make bigger towels, default chairs more, a little bit more structural integrity. And I see that more often, like where they're trying to equal out the playing field, even though they themselves have put themselves in the bracket of unequalness. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think that there is a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of gaslighting in the movement. So one of their biggest things that they try to use is the idea of fairness, which it's not fair to kick somebody else off a plane because you're too fat to fit in one seat. That is not fair. True. So the fairness is not real. As far as like towels and that kind of stuff, it's really just numerical. It has to do with how many people are a certain size. And so again, I think because they're so big, they want to push other people to be as big as them so that they can get a bigger towel. Well, it, it's kind of working it's though. I mean, like a lot of westernized countries are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And even some of the eastern countries too are starting to get up there. Yeah, a lot of that goes back to seed oil consumption, which I talked about earlier. And eastern countries are using more of these oils and they're gaining weight like crazy. Oh, it's probably so better than them starving. Like, uh, I think like, depends. what yeah. did I, I read something recently where it was like the farmland that we use has been slowly but surely decreasing, but we're able to produce more and more food from that particular farmland. So like, I feel like slowly but surely we're reaching an, a point where food might not be a problem in the next like 50 years or so. Cause even here in America, we got like fat homeless guys. Yeah. That's pretty wild. That is wild. We're, yeah. We're failing. So like we're failing upwardly. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that, you know, I'm all for food security, but I, I do think, I mean, obviously, could you imagine if I was like, I want people to be food insecure, that would be yeah, kind of wild. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm all for that. But what I, I think it's important to acknowledge is that the quality of the food should still be ethical. And I think if we're being given something that is damaging people's hormones, health, hormonal health, because of reasons, you know, these seed oils, they are not good for the environment either. They have to get all this soil to make the soy and all this crap. It's a waste of those, of that soil resource. You know, they're not using that soil for fruits and vegetables or even meat. They're using it for things like soy so that they can put it in everything. And people don't acknowledge like, hey, if you have soy in every single thing you're eating, it's going to make your estrogen higher. You know, it, it, it wouldn't if it was just a teaspoon of the soybean, right? But if you're having in every single thing that you're eating and every single processed food basically at the grocery store has this in it. And so it's, it's a very weird, you know, I do agree with FA when they talk about the corporate side of it and big food. And that is a huge reason why obesity is becoming an issue. But instead, we're talking about towels. <laughs> I mean, think about it. I find that when people talk about like the soy or like, for instance, I know that there's this, this is like statistic that goes around where it's like men have lost, like the average man today has 40% less testosterone than the man mm -hmm. that did back in the 1960s, or the 1950s. And that could be attributed to, for instance, like plastics. And that can also be attributed mm -hmm. to things like soy and that could be attributed to things like, you know, all these things that are now incorporated Pollution. into food. Exactly. Yes. And I always thought that never made any sense because these things are so incredibly micro dose. Like, I mean, sure, like I'm firmly against that drinking plastic, like obviously, though I am holding a plastic straw. I um, also like personally, I don't really consume a lot of soy, but obviously a lot of things I do eat do contain soy. But I often think mm -hmm. most people nowadays are living here in America. Obviously, I'm talking about America. Most things I'm going to talk about are in America since I live in America. But mm -hmm. um, I find that the reason why a lot of people have lower testosterone, for instance, is because most people back in the 1960s did have a physical job. And then if you don't use it, you lose it. So the testosterone production is not going to be as high naturally because you're not really using your body mm -hmm. in the way that you would have if you were working, I don't know, in the fucking cornfields or you were putting up mm -hmm. electrical wires or building the highway system or whatever. And um, the same thing could be said for like plastics and things like that. Um, people don't have really a bad sleeping schedules nowadays and mm -hmm. sedentary yeah, jobs and things like that. Together for sure. I think, I, that, but I think that's the majority of it. I think that that's probably the main reason why testosterone and other things like that. I think that's probably the reason. Personally, I'm not saying that the soys and other things aren't a problem, but I think yeah, that's probably think the bigger when reason. I, yeah. Well, when I talk about soy and stuff like that and the estrogen, I'm not talking about it in relation to testosterone. I'm talking about it in relation to thyroid hormone. So in your body, thyroid hormone is opposed by estrogen. So if you have high estrogen, then your thyroid hormone 
is weaker in your body, which slows your metabolism over time. So that's why there's this stereotype of you're thin when you're a kid and then you just blow up like a beluga whale but when you're in your 40s. What, what I'm but like, I just want to I just want to ask you this question. Like, are you saying like the soy is what's raising the just I'm sorry, raising the estrogen? Yes, oh, because there's so much of it. It has to do with it's not a micro dose. It's like a drastically huge dose. Like, what do you mean? It's like in everything you're eating. Like, can you give me some so examples because, of what it might be okay. in like commonly used? It's in chocolate. Okay. It's in any fast food product. It's in if you get pasta sauce, it's mm -hmm. in pasta sauce. It's in your any crackers, anything that's processed will typically have soy lecithin in it. Mm -hmm. For example, that's definitely in that category. Also, any plant-based meats typically have soy in it, not every single one. But even if it doesn't, then it's super high in seed oil. It's very high in those oils and those fats. Um, so if you think about especially processed foods, these foods, they do impact hormone health and they will lead you to gain weight. Most people that binge or that eat a lot, they're eating a lot of very processed foods and over time your metabolism slows. And then when you eat healthy, you also eat foods that are highly processed or estrogenic. So you'll be like, oh, I'm eating healthy. I'm going to have tofu instead of steak for dinner. That sets a person up to have a worse hormonal outcome. And so it can make weight loss less sustainable and more of an issue because it makes you hungry. Essentially, you feel hungrier. You feel more tired. The only reason I've been able to be so active is because I have been working on my thyroid health. Right. If I didn't, I would be basically dead, you know, <laughs> like if not literally dead, honestly, but I'd be basically catatonic. Like I would not be able to have any energy to walk. So, and so are, what, are you saying like, for instance, like the foods that we eat, right? Like all these foods that have mm -hmm. like soy and stuff like that, you, you attribute that to primarily where the estrogen is coming from. But like you, when people are gaining weight, their it's bodies are going to naturally be producing more testosterone because of the S because of the, uh, the amount of weight is, is a direct correlation yeah. to the amount of, like there was that woman that I was just talking about that got cancer. She had cancer because her body was, mm -hmm. she was so big that she had, I think it was, um, the mm -hmm. egg sac cancer. And she had to mm -hmm. lose weight to alleviate that problem. Luckily, she did lose yes. weight. But I think that the majority of people that do have those higher estrogens, if they are fat, is probably a consequence of being fatter. I mean, I don't know necessarily if like... It absolutely is, yes. Uh, I don't know necessarily if it's, it's like the food. I do agree that food in general probably should be a little bit mm -hmm. of better quality. But I always like err on the side of we should let the consumer decide what they want to eat. I think these foods should be 100%. Like, you know, if you want to go to Mickey D's and grab yourself a couple QPs or whatever, I think that should always be on mm -hmm. the table. And I just hope that the person is more yeah, well informed. Yeah, I just think, yeah, I think informed consent is important. I think people should know, like, hey, if I'm eating this McDonald's, it's going to trash my thyroid, basically. People should know that that's what's happening. You know, people don't smoke a pack of cigarettes thinking that they're going to be healthier afterwards. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, but people genuinely believe that there's no difference between eating McDonald's, like having a McDo McDonald's French fries and making your own French fries with like beef tallow. And it's completely different the way your body takes it. And it can even be the same amount of calories. Now, these effects, they're more drastic or more dramatic if you're fatter yeah. because you feel it more too. So that's an aspect that happens too. You know, I don't talk a lot about the hormone health of thin people it's just not relevant to my channel no i agree but i think most of the all time of these... like when you talk about thin people stuff it's yeah. like so disingenuous because i hear these fat activists talk about that a lot where like thin people have the same conditions as fat people i think it's really no. it's really cringe yeah because while i do think the average person may have more estrogen now it doesn't mean that that's you know what i'm saying like you yeah. said there's a lot of factors that get in touch with it. your feminine side right <laughs> estrogen is not necessarily communication it's, it's is a key. stress hormone it's more of a stress hormone but i think progesterone is more of the you know female beauty hormone i guess but um it's funny because people do think like estrogen is the female hormone and it, it's definitely more involved in female reproductive health but it's not actually what makes a woman beautiful so to speak it's actually progesterone that does that but 
just like testosterone makes a man more, you know, manly, I guess. But in terms of like estrogen, it, it opposes thyroid hormone, which is what I talk about. You know, that's where I'm coming from. And when you're very fat, like you said, even those environmental factors, they're just blown up and like extremely compounded because the fat itself is also super estrogenic. So like if I were to eat soy, I would probably have a much different outcome than if you were because the estrogen effect will hit me like a sack. It's like multiplicative, right? Yeah. Yes. It's like like Goku and Vegeta fusing, you know, like they get that extra power boost. Everything hormonal is layered. So if you add something, so like if you take, it's like, think about a normal fat activist or something, right? Like they're eating tons of seed oils, which is estrogenic. They're having tons of soy. That's estrogenic. They're super morbidly obese. That's estrogenic. They're maybe drinking a lot. Alcohol can be estrogenic. They're smoking weed. That's estrogenic. I mean, if you look at how many layers. Yeah. Well, vaping, I don't think is estrogenic, but I'm just saying, like, if you think about how many layers that is, and then they're on birth control at the same time. And then maybe it's in the plastics, right? And then maybe it's in the environment too. Then that's a lot. Then it's like, holy crap. And that's how you can get cancer like that one woman did. She probably had so many layers of estrogen. And obesity, I will agree, it's definitely the biggest thing. Like, it's the number one thing. thing. I think that, like, I get what you're saying. Like, you're saying, like, all these other things are, like, super Mm -hmm. micro-dosing you and stuff like that. But I think yeah, that, and the layers of it. I yeah, mean, the layers somebody like stacking who's... up, right? Like yes. like the layers of a pyramid almost. And yes. um, I think that's I think that's probably true. Like I agree with you, but I think uh, the main reason for these people, which you probably agree with too, is just like the food, um, the amount of food that they eat, which is making yes, them fat. Of course. And uh, I'm not saying that other stuff is, but I like to say like generally speaking, it's got to be the food, right? Like that other stuff is, I'm sure it's affecting them, but like how much is it affecting them in correlation to the foods that they're actually eating in terms of the quantity and the calorie count? Yeah, well, it's more so about typically what it does. So if your hormones are trashed, you're just going to be really hungry. Okay, so the hunger in a lot of very fat people is real. It's very real. And I think that that's something that people a lot of times cannot understand. And again, even from where I've been to where I am now, my hunger is drastically less Yeah, being smaller. It is just so much different and being much less hypo than I was three or, you know, almost four years ago now. It's so different. So I think that that's a major problem is that it just makes you really, really hungry and it makes you really, really tired. And so oftentimes people that are big, they eat more because they're exhausted. So you have to function like at a job, for example, if you have zero energy, then you're going to be like, I got to eat that candy to give me some energy. Or hit that Mickey D's because it's right there. Yeah. Yeah. I I often say it's like, it's like if you should be getting eight hours of sleep, it's like waking up off two or four hours of sleep, being fat and being overweight, being obese, all this is like, it's like, it's rough. You're chronically feeling terrible. Yes. And again, um, a lot of the hormonal stuff I talk about, it is within the the confines of obesity because that's what I focus on. I do care about the environment and things like that. I think it's really important to cut down pollution, you know, and whatever and transition from certain things that we're on. But that's a very long process. It's like a very big thing. You know, we got to tell those Indian guys to calm down on that. Right. Always filling up their waterways with uh, super amounts of, like, plastics and cardboards. And they bathe in it, too. Well, I guess. I don't know. Anybody who's polluting the environment, you know, it's like we we have... There's going to be some pollution. I would love it if we could transition off of plastics in literally everything and on everything. You know what I mean? Like, I think that would really help. But those are, like, very big goals. The biggest goal that I see right now is just getting you know, trying to close Pandora's box of this obesity issue, because this is going to, people are going to, you know, we've already seen, like you said, people are dropping dead in yeah. their thirties. Which is crazy I mean, because it's like, we're living in this era now where we have all this medical intervention, the best technology yeah. ever now. And then yet people are still like, we've succeeded so heavily that we've, we're like, people are literally like dying, yeah. <laughs> dying from the effects of succeeding. Yes. 
Yeah. And I do think that there is, like I said, there is an informed consent with some of the food that people are eating. Like if I knew about those damn oils, I would have stopped a long time ago. Right. But it, it's hard because I wouldn't necessarily have believed it either unless if I almost died from it because I was very stubborn, you know. So there's a reason why people don't, you know, people don't lose weight because they're not they believe certain things about weight loss and they're not willing to change their mind so if like let's say a super morbidly mm -hmm. obese person right super typical when you ask them how do you lose weight they'll say something like i know i need to eat chicken breast and vegetables and that's it and a thinner person will hear that and they'll be like okay that sounds great that'll totally work the issue is it's not a balanced diet. There's not enough saturated fat in that type of diet. There's not enough carbohydrate in that type of diet. You're going to have no energy. You're going to be starving. And you're probably just going to end up binging later because it's not a sustainable diet. What I would say is something like you should be having bacon. Bacon is incredibly satiating. It would be better if it was organic and all that stuff, right? I always got to say that. But it's like, let's keep it real, right? Who not everybody can afford being organic and all that. Bacon over but chicken the breast? higher fat. Huh? Bacon over chicken breast? Yes, because when you're super morbidly obese, you actually have more caloric leeway than people think. Yeah, of course. Yeah, because so you've been eating so much. So, yeah. like, the gap is going to be a lot higher than it would be for a thinner person. Yes. And also, too, like, it takes so much more for you to just move around because you're huge. You know, like, somebody like Amberlynn Reed, her... BMR is probably drastically higher than, you know, a woman of an average size at her height. Do you get what I'm saying? And yeah, she's going to be, be burning like... more calories because she is more of a person. Yeah, because just moving around, running the blood through everything, it takes more calories. Mm -hmm. And lift and getting up and just, you know, that feeling of it, it's exhausting. It's a very exhausting state. So a lot of times people who are very, very huge like that, they need to eat more dense foods or foods that are higher in calories or especially saturated fat or carbs or these types of things like because that's how I lost weight I would have like bacon and cheese and then I'd have sometimes like orange juice or a lot of times orange juice that's interesting but at the end of the day the calories are still in a deficit so you still lose but they are hyper palatable whereas for like a thin person those kind of foods would feel like, ooh, it's really heavy or it's very, very, like, dense. Or, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it feels different. But for a very fat person, it's like your digestion is usually trash as a fat person. Like, you're barely even absorbing. A lot of times what you eat is just turning into fat because you're, like, barely even digesting it. Yeah, it's because it's not, it's, you don't actually into... need it because it's not – you're so fat that it's like you already have the reserves. I've always thought mm – -hmm. I've always worked on this this idea – that if you were fatter, you should you should probably be trying to maximize the amount of food that you can eat, given the fact that you're going to be hungry a lot. Because most of these fat mm -hmm. people are eating consistently throughout the day, right? Mm -hmm. And if they're not, it's I think personally, it might be the anomaly. Though I think a lot of fat people could be getting fatter from eating like, for instance, going to McDonald's and you get yeah. a QP and a large fry. That's already a thousand calories right there. You yeah. know, so that's going to be super easy to put down. I, I think you could struggle to find anybody that couldn't mm -hmm. eat that and still not be hungry. But I usually mm -hmm. think that if you're fat, you should be eating like very, very, very uh, not so dense foods in terms of calories, but dense foods in terms of like what you're actually eating. So like, for instance, vegetables are going to be super, they're going to fill you up quickly. Meats, depending on what the meat is. Chicken breast is super dense. Um, takes a while to actually digest too. And because it's lean, it's like the leanest protein out there with the exception of fish. And then maybe a carb source. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of carbs, right? And fats as well. But I always worked on the assumption of you should be eating that as much as you can since you're already going to be like hungry all the time. So you should be maximizing what you're already eating as much as you can. And get you're getting little out of it as well. Yeah, I would say I used to feel that way too. But like when I would do something like that, I would just be starving, you know? And when I did it differently... So when I had more like fat, for example, or I had, like I said, like orange juice or something, I was actually less hungry. 
really over a long period of time yeah but remember i also wasn't having seed oil consumption which that right. does affect your satiety as well so i did do a major shift in my diet but it was still like that kind of like i'm gonna eat chicken breasts and vegetables for dinner that would be i'd be starving it's like even a if it was like a like lot of food like like, I'm not saying well, you have to I eat mean, chicken breast all the time. There's other meat sources yeah, and other I mean, things like steak, hamburger. It depends. Hamburger. Like, a lot of times it's really low calorie. You know, chicken breasts can be Right, but then you, you supplement that because usually you're supposed to be in a calorie deficit. I don't know how much of a calorie yeah, deficit of most of these people are going to be on. But if you're eating something like 3,000 calories a day, you're going to be gaining some serious weight off that. Depending on – if you're a woman, for instance. Like, most women don't even need to eat more mm -hmm. than 2,000. So if you're eating 3,000, that's a major calorie over that. Mm -hmm. So if you even that's lower true. it by, like, 27 – Right, which is like a pretty not that's not a steep deficit, but it's you're still gonna lose mm -hmm. weight at that amount, especially if you've only been eating three thousand yes. for like twenty years. So if you take that like twenty seven and you're eating like four or five times a day, very low calorie meals, but it adds up to twenty seven, mm -hmm. you're gonna be satiated throughout the entire way. day because you're eating so consistently and it's filling you up too. Because a lot yeah, of these foods are very filling. You could do it that way for sure. I think that would be it's just, I think it might be difficult lifestyle wise. Like I would typically do more of like a big meal. So more like less frequency of eating bigger meals. That's how I did it. Mm -hmm. Cause it was just easier lifestyle wise. And at the end of the day for weight loss itself, it's about being in the deficit and being able to stick to it. Yeah. And I just think that a lot of times, um, and again, I speak from a super morbidly obese perspective. So it's like, it's a very specific physical state to be in where certain foods like chicken breast, they're not satiating. It's just very, very like, I don't know how to describe it. It's like you're eating air. It just doesn't really? hit you. I don't know. Yeah. It's like nothing. Because I know people that are very fat. They're hung. They, we are hungrier. Like you don't. Oh yeah. I know that certain foods just don't hit you as well. Yeah. Whereas I understand cause I've lost weight. And so, like, I've spent a lot of time when I've been losing this weight, I've actually had a lot of, like, candy even, because I don't eat bread, so I never have any grains. I can't have bread because I can't handle gluten. So for me, it's like, I would eat peeps or something, which I know is not the best. But that would be my carb source because I'm not ever eating rice or bread or anything. So if I cut that out, it's like well, I'm what, basically what like would be like a very paleo. satiating if you can give like some examples of what you think would be like satiating for like an obese person to eat as like a substitute. Something like ice cream would be ice cream. Something. Yeah. Ice cream would be probably one of the top things that would be very satiating because it has a lot of nutrition in it, especially if it's high quality. And ice has cream has a lot of nutrition. It, what, what, do you, what do you mean by nutrition? Nutrition, I mean, like macros. Okay. So if you think about like sugar, mm -hmm. that's a carb source. It's very easily digestible. Mm -hmm. If you look at saturated fat, it's very high in ice cream. If you look at dairy yeah. and calcium, it's in there too. Mm -hmm. And the protein is also in there. Very limited so that protein. Would be, it is limited, but it's still there for sure. Usually but when I'm somebody says like a... Food a very nutritious food meant not many people will go with ice cream like most people would go yeah, with, most people would go with like oh chicken because that you know that usually has a giant that's like a lot mm -hmm. of protein that's like predominantly protein very few of everything else i guess a yeah. little bit of it, fat in there it does have a lot of protein for sure but it does have less you know of the fat the yeah carbs, but then you can always supplement right, though, right? if you wanted some fat into the diet you can chicken breast and then you could throw a fat source in there and then you can also throw in a carb source as well wouldn't that be like the same thing like wouldn't that be a lot of calories to eat ice cream as opposed to like a plate of something that would be actually like filling like i don't i don't I, to me eating ice cream does not sound filling at all like i feel like i can eat a lot of ice mm -hmm. cream and not be hungry yeah well i'm telling you it, it is it's definitely one of those foods that's more satiating towards a very fat person that's typically why they eat it so much because it's filling but so they, in but, terms of like okay. if you think about like think about if you are super morbidly obese and you're just always hungry all the time and then think about what kind of foods would finally bring that hunger down and then think about what a lot of fat people eat burgers and fries so i see like, that pizza yeah pizza is very satiating but it needs to be strong ingredients and all that stuff and i'm not necessarily saying 
the thing that people tend to forget too is like caloric realism is a thing so you need to count the calories in your pizza you need to count the calories in your ice cream you need to count the calories in everything but if these foods are more satiating in general then because they're hyper palatable your system is trashed as a fat person it's like you don't digest food very well your digestion is trashed your stomach acid is lower so something like chicken breast it just it it doesn't hit you in the same way that it hits a thin person it just doesn't and by nature because you have more caloric leeway because you're big then you can still do it you know and then as you get thinner then you kind of you know i'm getting to a point now where i can't really I'm hungrier if I eat mm -hmm. something like candy. Right. Whereas before it would be satisfying to me. Now I'm starting to feel hungrier and I'm finding I need to eat more protein. Right. Or more okay. fat. So you're saying like so at first like you should you maybe feel... like, I, I think mm -hmm. it's probably a good idea for, because a lot of people can't just transition to bad eating habits mm -hmm. to good eating habits. Just like, like not many people can do that. It's very difficult. Yeah. So I always recommend or people to go hyper slow. Hyper palatable to normal. Nah, yeah, I yeah. always recommend people start off really slow. Like you're not going to jump into the deep end and think that you're going to succeed. Most of the time, if you do that, you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. So I'd always recommend like even because a lot of people have a problem with fast food and Uber Eats, things such and so forth. Like that is obvious. Like people are literally like entire mm -hmm. Uber Eats alone makes so much money a year. And yeah. people have a problem with fast foods and eating out. And I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with eating these particular types of foods. It's just like to what quality, to what amount are you eating this in comparison to like the actual food mm -hmm. food that you should be eating, you know? So I think you're well, probably right. Too. I think you're probably right on the sense of like people should be like s slowly dipping their mm -hmm. toes into the water and then eventually they should yeah. be, you know, fixing the or diet. Or just acknowledge that. I think what needs to be acknowledged is that somebody's body in a super morbidly obese state is experiencing food differently than somebody who's thin. I know and that it feels different. I have a, I have like, I have a few fat friends, right? I have a few obese friends as well, and I know these dudes can throw down like three, four QPs, not even feel it, and they're they're making a second run around in the drive through, mm -hmm. and they're they're getting they're picking up the second order. You know, I've seen these dudes throw mm -hmm. back. For me, I could probably dust two QPs, two quarter pounders, mm -hmm. maybe a large fry, maybe. Um, this dude I know, many fat people I know, anecdotal, of course, they can throw down right. three, four of them, no problem. And they'll probably mm -hmm. eat like 30, 40 minutes later. Yeah. 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 So that depends. Well, I don't think that too. a lot of those foods are satiating though. Like, I don't think eating a burger is very satiating. I don't think so. I think that like eating like a, a balanced diet, if you get a lot of different stuff in you, it's going to be like fruits and vegetables and things like that. These things are mostly water. That's going to fill you up. Yeah, well, I like I said, I don't typically have bread, for example. Um, but I would still say like the actual meat itself is more satiating than like a chicken breast. It is, but in terms of like the fries and all that, like absolutely not. You know, because those fries are in that other kind of fat. It's really not satiating at all. But if they were in beef fat, you would get full. You do because your body views it differently. I always like to look at the body as like a, I like to think of the body as like a, a wood burning stove. Like it doesn't really matter what wood you put into it. It's going to burn regardless, but some wood might burn a little bit more efficiently, but like not by much, maybe like 5% more efficient. I think it's true in a caloric sense. Yes. But in the subjective feeling and the hormonal effects of satiety. So what will actually get you to be done eating those hormones, they do depend on what you're actually eating. So you if you're so? just like, oh, yeah, especially the difference between seed oil fat and saturated fat is just not even a question. You will be way more satiated from like a steak than having a tofu, whatever. Yeah, I think I probably agree with that. Yeah. Calorie by calorie. Yeah, it's because of the kind of fat. Or if you were to have fries cooked in coconut oil versus cooked in soybean oil, it's just you're going to be like, oh, like you're going to be full. When the, with those coconut oil fries, it's gonna be it, it hits you differently because the your body and your brain and everything can register that type of fat better because we're more we're supposed to be eating more of that than what is commonly thought. Which the more that we as a society have steered away from saturated fat, the worse obesity has gotten. It's almost a complete comparison if you look at the decades 
80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, people have been demonizing saturated fat all those years, and people are getting fatter and fatter. I think there's it's been a pretty good food. shift, though, in the last few years. Like, people are starting to understand how great yeah. fats are now. Like, people, their entire yeah. diet's now dedicated to just only eating fats. Yes. Yeah. And I think there can be a whiplash, too, where then there's a, an over demonization of carbs. Which yeah, that's exactly what's happening now. Issues. Yeah, that's happening that right now. Bring now. Its own like the pendulum swung all the way back through and it like completely mm -hmm. overcorrected it. I agree. Actually, I agree with that. Yeah. I, I, people really shit on carbs like heavy. Oh, yeah, they really do. And I appreciate that you don't, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, <laughs> I appreciate I, that. Yeah, no, I love carbs. Because I do think that a ketogenic diet, it can benefit very, very, very few people. You know, I'm talking like somebody who maybe has PCOS. It might be beneficial for someone like that or somebody who has epilepsy right like it could be helpful to prevent seizures yeah it's very example. niche it's a very niche diet yeah it's a very niche thing and it's being promoted as like everybody should do it and especially fat people and it's probably in in general it's one of the worst things a very fat person could do for sustainable weight loss because it is hostile to the thyroid it your liver needs carbohydrate to help convert your thyroid hormone. So if you just cut out all carbs, that process is drastically reduced. And so if you're already hypo and then you do keto, typically it will be like 25% worse. So it's like a really huge cut. And so telling very fat people to cut all carbs in general, while like you said, it may work for very niche people in certain circumstances, in general, it's not a good idea and it's heavily promoted. And that's another issue that we have in society. It's mm. like it's also like jumping I, into the deep yeah. end. Like you're trying something very, very drastic yeah. as opposed to what you were just doing, which is like probably eating anything and everything. Yeah. Or just honestly, like I said, what I did is I just focused on cutting out seed oils. If I wanted a hyper palatable food, I'd make it myself. So like when I first started, I was so ravenous. I was like, so, like I said, I was near death. I don't know how else to say it. I was very, very hypo, extremely hypothyroid. And so I was just craving tons of fat and tons of carbs and tons of this, you know, just tons of all the stuff. But I got off the seed oils and within six months, my appetite drastically reduced. And I also just, I started to have more of a normal hunger response. You think that maybe, you think that weight, has a lot to do with the seed oils or do you think that it maybe just had to do with the fact that you were like recompositioning the way you ate, you know, like you were changing up the fact that maybe you ate a lot more here and then maybe you were reducing that. Uh, me, I mean, maybe, I don't know what you mean by that. What do you mean? So like when you were at that point in your life where you were like near death, right? I'm mm -hmm. guessing you were eating like pretty much anything. Like you didn't have limits yeah. or like you just like your diet was open. I ate a lot of chips, for example. That was a yeah. major part of my diet, which yeah. is very high in those oils. Yeah, chips are fucking yeah. terrible too. And super, yes. like a lot of just useless, useless uh, nothing in those. But yeah, okay. But could it be like instead of the seed oils? I mean, I don't know. I'm just asking, right? Could it be mm -hmm. instead of the seed oils, could it just be you readjusting to a new diet and now your body's like recognizing like this food is way better than all this food that you were eating before? I think there's multiple factors for sure. I would say probably because I had stopped my BED cycle as well, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I wasn't doing keto anymore. For example, I stopped doing keto. I wasn't. Oh, you were actually doing keto? Mm -hmm. Was that I one of your it. first diets that you tried to do? No, I, it was one of the last ones I did actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. I really didn't want to. But, um, yeah, I had very severe BED episodes with that diet where I would. I gained and lost the same 80 pounds within a year, oh. twice. So that's very severe ED yeah. behavior. And um, it was a horrible experience. It The diet made me feel so incredibly insane. So not, like I said, because I was already very, very, very hypo. So when I was doing that diet, it's like you're taking 25% off of like what I had like 30% left. You know what I'm right, saying? And I, know what like saying. I was already in such a weak state. You're burning the candle on both ends. Yeah, it made it even worse. And so I think part of it is that I stopped the that cycle. I stopped the restrict and B, you mm. know, R and B cycle. Right, right. And um, so I think that's part of why my satiety went back up. 
but I definitely think the seed oil consumption did have an effect as well. It's just, it's very like, um, it takes a long time to, to notice a difference. And sometimes you, you know, may not even like, notice it. Like sometimes cause you're living mm-hmm. in your own body and slow. that you don't even yeah. notice it. Like I often say, if you're living with somebody and you lose weight, they may not notice it. But if you meet somebody after a year and you've lost a lot of weight, they notice it instantly because you, mm-hmm. this is the first time them seeing you. And so it's, it's very important to actually keep track of those like actual small things. Cause you may mm-hmm. not even notice them. Yeah, but definitely, like, I didn't just cut seed oils. Like, I changed my entire lifestyle. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I let go of certain toxic mindsets I had. I moved. I, I, I moved back with family. Like, I was completely isolate in 2020 for reasons, you know, that we know all too well. Um, It was horrifically traumatic. You know, I I was never outside because I, I worked from home. So I changed everything. I had a, a job where I was outside all the time. I lived in a less polluted environment, which, yeah. you know, I live in the South. It's less polluted. I lived with family, so I wasn't alone all the time. Yeah. And so there was a lot of things that helped. So it's really important to look at it holistically. What I typically talk about in terms of the seed oil consumption is just most people have no idea that it does have an effect. And the biggest effect it has is it just makes it harder to even stay in a deficit because even if you were to look at it just completely purely based on calories they are a waste of calories they don't have any nutrition in it they don't help you they're very very just there they just you just gain the weight whatever you eat of them it just goes into fat basically it doesn't help you whereas like saturated fat it helps build hormones it helps your body you know it, it does a lot of there's a lot of things it does um and same with protein and carbs and all these things like they have an effect on your hormones but those oils they don't help you oh they so give you the calories if, and the basic yeah well they wouldn't go yeah, directly would to fat unless caloric. like they needed to yeah well it depends it depends because you're it depends on how messed up you are basically because they are they're very like inflammatory and so your body freaks out over it and it tries to get rid of it really fast because it's like, oh, sh- like, what is this? It doesn't know how to do it because it's not natural. Like that has literally been used for like machinery and then they just put it in the diet. It's not a natural form of fat whatsoever. It's very new and it o- they only started doing it like a hundred years ago. So it's only been around for a hundred years. Right. Really. So we, we don't know like the adverse effects of this thing. Yeah. Because it's so incredibly new. Is- yeah, they have upped the consumption of it decade over decade for a hundred right? years. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess I th- I think it's it's possibly even subsidized too. Oh yeah, it depends. Uh, I know that McDonald's used to use that uh, beef beef um, mm-hmm. oil for a very long time, but I know that since like I believe the late nineties, they switched over completely to like canola oil. Mm-hmm. I think it's soybean. It's hydrogenated oh, soybean. soybean oil. Yeah, it's really bad. I used to work at McDonald's. It's horrible. But yeah, I mean, that's so I just think it's it's very similar to like a trans fat. It's that same kind of thing where it's it's a very like your body just doesn't really know what to do with it. I mean, it can survive off of it, but it is like a very harsh type of thing to live off of. Whereas if you look at like, you know, fruits and meats and things like that. That's what we're kind of like, our bodies know what to do with that. It's like your body knows. It's like, oh, this is a fruit. This is how to process it. You know, it's easier. Even something like bread, your body knows how to process bread. You know what I'm saying? It's it's glucose. It's a carb. Your body knows what to do with it. I know what you're but saying. Those I, oils, I, I understand like, what you're food. saying. I don't personally yeah. look at it like that. I kind of look at it as like your body will utilize whatever it can utilize at that particular moment in time. And if it doesn't have a need for that particular thing, it will just put it somewhere else like fat, you know? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I don't look at it like that. I think that if you're eating fats or whatever, seed oils, for instance, I don't know. I haven't looked into like, obviously, you're more well, mm-hmm. well-researched on this than me. Um, but from the research yeah, that I've I totally done, understand too because like I did not want to believe it because it – I had to completely change my whole lifestyle. You know, it was hard because obviously being in such an extreme hypothyroid near death state, right? Obviously I had been doing this for 
decades, right? And I was so into eating those kinds of foods because I was taught saturated fat is bad, sugar's bad, carbs are bad, you know, everything's bad, but they never say these oils are bad. So I thought it was fine. So I ate it all the time. So whether I was off a diet, off the rails or whatever, or I was on a diet, I was constantly eating them for decades. And again, you have to look at the overall picture, right? Like if, if you, for example, if you had like, I don't know, maybe 10% of your calories with seed oil consumption, it'd be very different than if it was 60%, which in a lot of these fat activists, it can be that high. 60%. Because I don't know what you eat. Oh, yeah, because they're very calorically dense. You know, fat is higher in calories. So if you get like chips, chips, I think the caloric amount, I don't know exactly, but I'm pretty sure over half of the calories in chips is from the oils. Yeah, probably. Because, yeah. So you have to think like, I don't personally, you know, maybe I could be wrong, but I don't think you're eating chips for every single meal, for example. Or every day. Yeah, but I don't think a lot of these fat activists are eating that either. I think most of these fat people are probably just they, eating really trashy, terrible foods. They might be yeah. eating like good foods every once in a while to like try to, you know, equal it out or say that they did eat something that was good that one time. So they have something to fall back on. I think that's probably. But mm -hmm. I think most of them are probably just eating Uber Eats. I think most of them have too much money mm -hmm. and they're just going out and they're spending McDonald's or uh, yeah. maybe like other fast food genres and don't get me wrong. Yeah. Those particular places are obviously coating their food in like yeah. terrible, food disgusting oils. things and stuff like that too. But mm -hmm. that food can't be like majority seed oil. Most of that is probably just low quality, low food. It depends. Food. If it's fries, then it absolutely is. If it's something like, if anything's fried, then it is fried in those oils. So it would be majority calories coming from that. Sure. If yeah. it's something else, like any sauces typically will have it, which again, the majority of the calories in that sauce is going to be from that. Like they add it to everything. I have friends that work in restaurants. It's in everything. Sure. Most of the time you get butter, it's country crock, which is seed oils. It's margarine. So, I mean, if any little bit of fat that you're having at a restaurant, it's probably not good. So people typically think like, oh, you know, it, it's, it doesn't matter. I'm having butter. Yeah. The butter is what's bad for me. It's not. You're having country crock. I think you sometimes know, people go overboard, butter. though. I knew a dude that was on that keto diet, and he was putting butter in his coffee. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, I don't really advocate for that either. Like, I typically, what I advocate for is just, like, don't have seed oils, especially if you're super morbidly obese. And again, I'm mostly talking to that category of people, right? Like, I don't really lecture what every thin person eats i just don't um if you want to do it then go for it right it's probably not going to hurt you as much as it would a fat person it's it's more about the percentage of what you're eating and you know your diet is an amalgamation of everything that you're eating right but in terms of a very fat person it's like most of the fat on your body has those oils in it so you already have a high amount just by virtue of being fat right and so you need to just avoid it and so I would just tell somebody, like, don't buy a store-bought cake. Make the cake yourself at home. It's maybe the same amount of calories or it's the same or it's easier to transition it. But it, essentially, you are still having a different fat profile. And over time, your satiety will go up as the months go on. Because I think, too, a lot of thin people, they have this idea that you can talk to a fat person and say, you need to just stop having cake or you need to just stop having pizza or you need to just stop having this or that, right? They'll think that way. But I know as somebody who has been super huge, we hear something like that, it goes in one ear and completely out the other. We might say, yeah, okay, that sounds like a great idea. They might do it for two days. And so that's it. And so ultimately nothing changes because, you know, I've had some friends that I've told about these damn oils and they have done a lot better too. It is a, it is a factor, sure. but it's a slow process. It just, you know, and people it seems don't like, like a tough, that. It they seems don't... like a tough prescription because if these, tough. if these things are like ingrained within like basically society as a whole, when it comes to dietary functions, mm -hmm. um, I feel like the messaging 
is just not it you know it's like i i hear people a lot it's when tough. it when, is tough when i hear people right like it's it's like if a guy was down on his luck and he didn't have any money left and he was broke and he got a, he's got a kid coming he's married his house is about to be foreclosed he's broke and then he comes to you and he says what do i do you know i got no money i'm in forever debt I need money today. Like I need money right now. My, my bills are due tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And then somebody goes, well, this is what we got to do. We got to go to the government. We got to put the picket fences. We got to go. We need basic income. We need, we need advocacy. We need this. We need, we need to make sure that people make money today. You know, all stuff that's never going to happen. You know, like, uh, that guy needs the money now, you know, that's not going to mm -hmm. help him. That dude is, he's fucked. He's done. He's done. He's, you didn't actually help the guy. And so I hear what you're saying, but like seed oils, I don't know. I just, it doesn't seem practical. It is practical. Like I did it in a very impoverished state. Like it's possible. Yeah, I'm not I saying like say. money is. Yeah. I don't think the money, like that analogy was just like you know that was just yeah. Sort of okay, I'm just saying like it could be difficult. I think you know anything is difficult when it comes to weight loss, but I've done it. You know, I've taken 90 pounds off. I've kept it off for almost two years. I fully intend on continuing. Right. And it's like, I think most people that do lose weight, especially sustainably, they are naturally cutting these oils and they maybe don't even realize it because they stop going to fast food. They stop having chips. They stop doing certain things and it might improve the numbers enough to where they're, they lose the weight and they keep it off. Right. But most people that do the diets, like do keto, mm -hmm. they're having salads with tons of seed oils on it. Do veganism. All the fake meat is pure seed oil. You know, a lot of vegan foods are very high, like vegan milks, for but example. But those people would still lose weight, though, because just by process of eating less than what their bodies but will actually they need. they keep it off? Yeah. If they but continue it's, down it's that a line, matter right? of Yeah, it, it's a matter of if they can keep it off. And most of the time, people can't. And you think like the, the, the cutting out of seed oil would be the defining factor of keeping it out? Of keeping it off, keeping yes, it off, yeah. because it has a metabolic benefit. Okay. And also an energy benefit because people, they don't lose weight primarily because they're hungry and they're tired. Okay. And so cutting out seed oils, it will reduce hunger and tiredness. And so if those two issues are resolved, then you're going to have a much easier time. I understand about the practicality argument. I totally get that. But again, I'm talking to people who are on death's door. I'm talking to people who are very big, you know, obviously I'm going to call out fellow fatties. You guys are eating a lot. So you clearly have enough money to eat a lot. You can make a change in that regard. I'm not talking about somebody who's, you know, impoverished and homeless on the street. Like, I don't, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't think most of those people are super morbidly obese. Like you said, they could be a fat person that's sitting there, right, on the street, which is horrifying. But it's it's just horrifying if for anybody to be homeless, in my opinion. But when you look at it, it's like, I wouldn't be talking to somebody who's barely eating, right? I'm talking to people who are really big. Yeah. Like somebody like Amberlynn Reed, if she just made her own stuff, and I think a lot of times there's a difference between what's practical and what's being lazy. People don't want to cook. Amberlynn doesn't even have a job. She could cook. Yeah, she has a lot of free time. She has a lot of free time. She has a lot of money. She just wants to put up some, a box in the microwave yeah order Uber eats like nine mindset. times a day yes <laughs> in that kind of mindset that is what will lead to your death you will die for convenience because it's an addiction to convenience in terms of seed oil consumption but that's what it is and it was it convenient for me to make my bacon fat potatoes instead of just buying french fries at walmart that were already in a bag yeah but was it really all that big of a deal not really you know and was it an easier transition to do that than to go from eating chips every single day to eating chicken breasts and vegetables and that's it it's like that's such a huge gap too yeah, i totally I, I think people should it. be use, using their yeah. kitchens more and more i i know so many yes. people that don't even step into their kitchen and they step to the front door to get the uber eats or the air fryer i know the air fryer is like the mm -hmm. number one now it used to be the microwave but now it's the air fryer which i guess is better technically right so i can't like fault them yeah, too much for that depending on what it is yeah, yeah depending on what they're cooking if it's like a pre-packaged food which again i think most people can understand and get behind like processed foods are bad i think it's pretty obvious 
but are they convenient? Yes, they are. I can just pin down and tell you exactly why it's bad. Right. I can say it's bad because of this. This is what makes it bad. But people intuitively know it's bad. And I always say, too, if people want to avoid sugar or like corn syrup or whatever, I don't think it's as bad as seed oils. But if you don't want to have it, you don't have to have it. It's not a necessity for life. But I think most fat people honestly are not going to not eat sugar. And I try to keep it realistic, too. You know, it's like, let's keep it real. Like, what is actually achievable? Like, you know, you're very fat people in your life, right? What would actually be achievable for them in terms of a diet change? It's like, you know. Yeah, it's all about the practicality. So, like, tell me uh, tell me about why you started your channel. Like, why you chose to do, like, fat acceptance. Okay. So, I chose to do it because, ultimately, I did my own research you know i literally by the time i figured out the seed oil issue i had tried every single other diet possible basically literally like i think i had done everything i had researched every diet i did it's really weird but i used my ed to like research and so i would document my experiences with every single thing that i did um i would think about the internal states of every single, you know, I tried veganism. Well, this is how veganism made me feel. I tried keto. This is how keto made me feel. I tried this. This is how that made me feel. Like just to such an extent where I had like a huge body of research because I had done it for so many years that basically I had exhausted every other option and I decided I'm going to just cut these damn seed oils, eat less estrogenic foods and do this thyroid thing mm -hmm. basically. And so I did that. I literally said it on my channel. I have a playlist where I have my my playlist of my experience over the past, you know, three years. And yeah. I said, I'm just doing this as an experience, as an experiment. I'm not suggesting it to anybody. I just have to see what happens. Because I was convinced that if I had sugar and saturated fat, I would die. Basically. That's what I thought thought would happen. But I had exhausted every other thing. Yeah. So I was like, whatever, if I'm gone, then I guess it was a good run because I wasn't getting any better. So I decided to do it over 2021. I got much better, drastically better over 2022. I drastically improved. Like I told you, I had energy. I was able to walk for three or four hours a day. That's really good. I started doing. Yeah, I started doing a caloric deficit towards the summer. I lost about 30 or 40 pounds in 2022. And I didn't gain it back. That's really good. I, yeah, I blew up a little bit over the winter because you swell a lot in the winter with hypo. But when the spring came, the weight came right back off really, really quickly. And then I lost another 50 pounds last year. And yes, I was counting calories. And yes, I was doing the, the, the other stuff. But I never denied any of that, right? Mm -hmm. But it was sustainable. It was something I could do. And so basically around the end of 2022... I had had so many changes on a physical health level that I was like, okay, I have to start telling other people about it. So I told a couple of fat people in my life, people in my family, um, my some friends that were struggling with their weight. I told them about it. And I said, maybe you should try it. I had a good experience with this. I saw that they also had a good experience with it or that they were also experiencing health changes for the better from doing this. And so when I had that, then I decided, okay, I need to talk about this in 2023. So I started to talk about it more on my channel in last year and make it more of a public thing, especially because I had lost weight and I decided to do it while I was still losing the weight because what I do for the most part, it's directed especially to super morbidly obese individuals who I know when they see a thin person talk about losing weight, they assume that they've never had their experience. And so I decided to just lose the weight publicly as a part of my activism because it was also something I could do to completely undermine fat acceptance rhetoric would be to lose a drastic amount of weight publicly right, over right, right. many Show years. don't tell, right? Yes, exactly. And show that it's wrong. Because one of the biggest things that I've done over the past couple of winters is show set point theory and how much of BS it is. Because I could lose weight, my weight would stagnate towards the winter. And then when the spring comes, I start losing again. And so I could show that and say, hey, 
fat acceptance is wrong when they talk about set point theory. Set point theory is bunk. It's not real. Right, yeah. You can lose the weight. So it's a way of showing it publicly. And so that's why I decided to do it. It's because I think that this needs to be known, basically. When so, did you, like I said, um, I want to resolve it. When did you get, like, real deep into it? Like, I mean, in, in terms of making content. About fat acceptance? Yeah. It started happening towards the end of 2022. Mm -hmm. because I, like I said, I had realized that I had figured something out in regards to this issue. And I was like, okay, I need to tell the world basically. And I started talking about fat acceptance rhetoric because I started really considering what are the barriers I've had towards losing weight. And a lot of fat acceptance rhetoric is very, very BED coded. And what I mean by that is that a lot of the logic that they have and that they push, it's stuff that people that have that ED think. So it's things like, I can't lose weight because I'm just meant to be this weight. That's something that somebody with an ED would say to themselves. Because it's like a way of denying reality. Right. Taking accountability of off it. themselves. Yes. And also trying to do anything to avoid getting rid of that coping mechanism because it's all about protecting the activity that you're doing which you know it's wrong we all know it's wrong right. i mean come on you know it's wrong to binge it's wrong it's very damaging it's very expensive it's extremely harmful to your body right like and it also just isn't very pleasant because there's a lot of really horrible things that go with that but when it's your main coping mechanism for trauma in your life you create lies and you try to protect yourself right with it and maybe you try to move so the goalposts back seeing... anytime somebody says something to you yes or you gaslight you say don't talk to me about this this is just the way my body is right you start seeing say, and i used to say things like that when i was a teenager like i would say i don't want to hear about my weight i don't want to talk about it that was how i said it because i've never been a fat acceptance person I never believed the rhetoric itself, but I had the ED and it's so similar. Right. I had the exact same mindsets. And so I just started to realize like this logic and what they're pushing on people and they're actually pushing people to not lose weight. And they're saying, if you lose weight, it's racist, <laughs> Yeah, which is like totally crazy. It's against black women. And it's like, yeah, which is really bizarre, but it's like, they're saying these things and they're pushing it onto other people. So it became like, I just realized like, I'm going to go after this rhetoric because this is one of the major things. That's a huge, huge issue towards people who are trying to lose weight is this actual rhetoric. It's probably just a really dangerous in general to people because like how many people can they convince and then have those people just not care about themselves anymore. And eventually that leads to them gaining weight, which is what we see already in America. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, yeah. And the rhetoric isn't new. I think that's what people don't understand too. Like it existed even in the two thousands. I think it goes all the way back to the sixties and yeah, it's yeah. just become more and more mainstream. And it really was becoming mainstream in the 2000s. And at this point, it is like almost taking over. It's taking over institutions. Like people are literally, I don't know, like we're signing in laws about fat now. There's even, you know? uh, I mean, there's think a, about how crazy that there's is. There's a particular TikToker that's like a HR person that you can go to and hire. And then she'll go in and fat train you. So that way you don't say something negative about somebody being fat. Are you kidding me? Yeah, there's a there's a bunch of them actually. Yeah, like fat training oh or something God. like that. Like you know, how they have like sexual assault training, or they have like she's uh -huh. a part of that, but for fat people, so you can't say specific things. Her videos are awesome. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Yeah, but yeah, that's what I'm saying, and it it's like I don't know, you know. I think too the other dangerous aspect of this movement, and what I noticed especially is that it's really oftentimes it's tied to other political movements where it really doesn't belong. It's not similar at all. Like the struggle, I've seen people talk about the struggle of weight and race. They're not similar at all. Uh, you can literally lose weight. There's no way to change your race. I mean, that is crazy. And then even in terms of like, I've seen it compared to conversion therapy, 
that losing weight, like Aubrey Gordon says that weight loss is a form of conversion therapy, which is incredibly homophobic of her. It's self-homophobia. She is a lesbian, but there's a lot of self-hating types of people. And I will say that loudly and proudly that she does because how dare she say that that is horrifically homophobic to compare being gay to being fat i don't think there's anything wrong with being gay i don't think there's i don't think it's a disease or whatever i'm not one of those i mean i'm sure you're so shocked but obesity (laughs) is definitely not right obesity is you know it's a disease it is there's no like adverse effects of uh being gay as opposed to being fat well, I mean, there might yeah. be like one or two, like if you meet the wrong guy, he might have a little something extra and then you didn't know. And how you going to prepare? Like, what if he swings it a little bit too fast? You miss an eye or something like that. Or he hits you on the head and you're just. I mean, there's benefits and drawbacks to certain things like being gay, but it's not at all similar to being fat, you know, and putting somebody through conversion therapy is not at all similar to losing weight. That is insane. That is an insane comparison. It's and it's homophobic because it minimizes what conversion therapy is, which is horrible. I think a lot of times so, they like to have those. Um, they like to draw those lines because it's more value. So if you sat there and you said like being gay is like being fat or like being black is like being fat because there's so many like oh we're so oppressed. You draw the line and then suddenly you're next to that group, you know. And then mm-hmm. suddenly your values are their values, and then now you have like mm-hmm. a big giant organization next to these these I actually minoritized. Or these uh, oppressed groups. Yeah, or just people that have had legitimate struggles, people who have had laws written against them, or people who have, you know, actually lacked rights. Fat people have never lacked rights. That has never existed. That isn't real. There was never a segregation based on fatness. That has never occurred. Yeah, if anything, we like, I hate it when they they always talk about how, like, they're so oppressed in america you know westernized countries and i always think like i don't even think there's another country in the world that could be as tolerant as it is in the ones we're in you know like we're the countries that literally like rep it actually yeah which is insane and it does need to stop but my whole thing is like i just i i think i saw that happening too and that's a huge issue for me so it was like no 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 like because for me i don't know it's very easy for me to cut a line in between the two things because some people they're just too nice you know i think a lot of people they're very nice and they just they're very scared to step on somebody's toes yeah and i'm just like i don't care i'm not a super nice person so for me it's really easy to be like you're dead wrong that is not the same thing as being gay how dare you even say that it's very easy for me to do that it's very hard for other people to do that and I think that's one of the reasons are. why they don't actually want to have a conversation because they know that if they did, their mm-hmm. ideas or their way of thinking would just like completely crumble. Not not because mm-hmm. I feel like if it were you arguing with them or something like that. I think in general, if somebody argued mm-hmm. even just basics with them, I think it would just completely collapse. Because like mm-hmm. most of these people, even though they've built like foundations, most of their foundations are built on like tofu dregs. Like they're they're so oh, wobbly. Yeah. And the reason why they, they consistently say the things they do is just because they've never been challenged. Right. And I think, too, um, it's also because for a lot of them, like I said, I believe, I personally believe a lot of it is tied to mental illness, too. I agree, yeah. So I think that that's, it goes kind of hand in hand with the rhetoric. So it's it doesn't actually make sense. But what bothers me is that people who aren't mentally ill start to listen. And they start to believe somebody who's suffering with an illness. And they, they listen to it. And then the institutions are like, yeah. We should totally base our entire society around this person that is struggling with a mental health issue and what they're, they should lead us. Yeah. It's crazy to me. A lot because, of it's like uh, diversity yeah. hires where they they need to like, oh, you know, this is kind of like this kind of getting a little bit big right now. So we might as well hire somebody that's like no, knowledgeable about it. And I see these fat activists be put into places that just don't even make sense. You know, mm-hmm. like in New York. You know they fat they passed that fat bill. I think mm-hmm. it was like fat fab feminist was um mm-hmm. like the major advocate for that, and they they like promoted her heavy for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think too, it, it's it's crazy to me because they 
there is this idea i don't know if it's a gen x thing i feel like it is kind of a gen x thing where it's like your experience is your experience and i can't speak on it and so if i'm different at all then i can't relate to you whatsoever to me that's a very gen x coded thing i think that's that's more of a millennial thing i feel like i feel like i've heard more millennials say that mm, i know because mm, i think it's because like a lot of our teachers and stuff said it when we were growing up but basically, they're the ones who are in control of the institutions. It's more of that Gen X level. So they hear somebody say, well, this I'm fat and this is my experience and it cannot be questioned. And I get that because then they say, oh, well, I've never been fat. So I believe you. I believe you if you say that you're not eating tons of calories, even though you clearly are. But for me, I've been that fat person. I know what it takes. I've been around fat people forever. I mean, hello, you know, a lot of fat people have a lot of fat people in her family. A lot of fat people have fat friends. I've been around it a lot. And I do think there are certain stereotypes. Not every fat person has BED, for example. Um, Not every fat person is drastically overeating. Sometimes it's just that slow weight gain over many, many years. Most people that are fat are just like maybe, you know, 50, 60, 70 pounds over. Like that's most. Yeah. So those kinds of people, it's not the same. It's like a passive kind of laziness thing or just, you know, you kind of forget about it or you just don't consider it because it's not like a dangerous, you're going to die tomorrow type of feeling. Whereas like, when you're really, really big, it is like a dangerous, you're going to die tomorrow type yeah. of thing. You're always thinking about it because you have to, because it's in your face all the time. You, you know, going back to that, like whole racism argument, like I've heard that quite a bit. I, I, I really think that these people need to get like better wordings and like better terminologies. Because like when I hear them say things like, oh, fat phobia is rooted in racism, fat phobia is rooted in misogyny, fat phobia is rooted in like all these different like isms, basically. I always think like, when have you ever heard that particular terminology ever be used in the same sentence before? And I feel like so many, I think, I think it's a good thing because more people, like when they hear that, they go, this, that is ridiculous. You know, like, what are you talking about? Cause when, when somebody says white supremacy, you know, what, what are you thinking about? You're not thinking about some dudes in a college somewhere saying that, oh, you know, if you eat too many, too many calories, you're going to gain weight. You're not thinking that's not a white supremacist. You're thinking about a guy with like a pitchfork, a hood running through your town saying black people are gay. You know, that's what you're saying. Right. So when you see that and then like I see it and I'm going like that, all right, that's, you know, you guys need to have better terminologies. And I wish they would because at least there'd be some kind of like argument point on those particular things because um, it's just too easy sometimes to hear these people talk. It's like you guys are losing so many of your audience just off that. Yeah. When I think too, it's, I don't know, it's just like, um, I mean, I hear a lot of people talk about, like, it's kind of co-opting the struggle. You know, it's like you, they take on a different struggle. And I found too, like, I watch a lot of, I've watched a lot of Jubilee videos, for example. Yeah, they're awesome. I hate them. But you watch them, though. I have to, because my audience demands me to. You guys force me to, I will say. But the fat acceptance, Jubilee is like, Ugh, like they always they push it so hard every thin person has you know starved themselves right like are, it's always are the you same talking about like the jubilees where they thing. have like i agree i don't middle agree ground. the middle yeah. grounds yeah okay huh. just getting some context yeah it's like a middle ground for example i just covered one gosh it like took over my throat so basically at this point i'm doing more full-time youtube so i'm transitioning i want youtube to be more so my job that's really good so I, i'm gonna focus i really love it when people like really push out a lot of content you know like mm-hmm. i love that i love seeing because i love consuming it personally so when i see people that are really pushing it out that's really great that's awesome yeah i just it's it's difficult for sure but i would just like i need to just launch completely because I just, I have so much to say about it. And I think this year I'm probably going to focus more on the ED aspect. Mm -hmm. Last year I focused a lot more on the hypothyroid aspect. Mm -hmm. This year I want to talk more about that because I think I'm just kind of seeing it more and more in how they talk. And I want to just point it out and just be like, hey, this is 
coming from this. Don't listen. But I think I just can't stand how much they they try to take on these other struggles. Oh, this is what I was trying to say. So when it comes to Jubilee, when they do this, when they have these discussions, you'll find that the vast majority of the time, they aren't even talking about fatness. They're talking about racism, or they talk about being a woman, or they talk about something that's totally irrelevant to weight. Like there, the amount of times that I have actually looked at discussions on fat issues and issues of obesity, they never talk about actually obesity. It's always about social issues and feelings. And they don't ever talk about the physical issues involved with obesity ever. So they don't actually talk about it. It's always about, well, society has to do this. Society has to do that. Well, what about how you're genuinely suffering as a fat person? Like, can we actually talk about that? And so that's what I try to do on my channel is I actually talk about the real struggles of being fat, the actual hormonal, physiological, emotional, every issue that comes from this issue. Because I'm not going to sit there and go off about politics or race or gender or something. I'm going to talk about fatness because it never is. Because people don't, in my opinion, a lot of times they don't want to deal with the issue. You know, they're, they're hiding it. It's always hidden. And I see it so much on Jubilee where it's, it's constant. Like I remember this one time there was this gay guy on there and he was just, it's like, he was just going off about being gay in the middle of a discussion about being fat. And it's like, this has nothing to do with being fat because being fat is universal. Anybody can be fat, you know? Yeah. Oh, it has nothing to do with any of these other things. So I find it so incredibly unproductive mm -hmm. to talk about all these other things. And that's why I work really hard to depoliticize the space as much as I can, because this is not a political issue. This is a physical issue. It's a mental health issue. And let's keep it where it is, because I think that that is one of the worst things that has happened to the issue is that it is becoming politicized. And that I would say is one of the biggest reasons why I fight fat acceptance, because when they politicize it, you create division on an issue where there is none and you create an <clears throat> issue where now nobody's talking about the actual issue and people are dying from this. You get me? So yeah, guys, that was it. Um, uh, obviously so the much. beautiful specimen himself, Great conversation. Uh, it was honestly a really great conversation. Great, very good conversation. Super amazing to talk to. Very informative. Very intelligent. Very attractive. Very gorgeous. Not to the gay men that I try to date. No, I'm just kidding. But That's definitely so to me. <laughs> but um, yep. You can go ahead and plug your channel one more time. Like you know, where can people find you? Your your stuff's all gonna be linked down below. By the way. Oh, thank you so much. So yeah, I'm graphically Alex, aka the Duff on my channel i'm just kidding i'm not but um <laughs> i'm in i'm in a deaf phase okay it's a phase it's not a destination but no it's graphically alex everywhere in instagram honestly i just post a lot of taylor swift lyrics which if you're about it if you're a swifty you should definitely follow me on instagram because it's like major but um mostly graphically alex youtube about it that's it basically that's Pretty awesome easy. um i would love to do more stuff with you in the future I would love to as well. This is really cool. I think one of the best things about like anti-FA in general is that it's people from all over that have different views and, you know, different walks of life and different experiences with the issue. And we all can like Colmigate together. You know? Yeah. The watering hole. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. And I think we need to support each other too. Like I tried, I want us to support each other in general because we are up against, you know, what we're up against a here. A big enemy. A big enemy. A real yes, big enemy. Sure. But thank you so much for having me. Yeah, no and problem. I would love to do more. Awesome. It's been great. All right. Well, I'll, I'll talk to you later.